Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us to the last session of the day with this fantastic panel on vaccinology and immunology, our best defense. Um, we are going to dive in into more details about vaccines, what it means, the trials and the implications for vaccine rollout with two um, very distinguished guests today for our panel. Dr. Gina Ogilvie, who is a tier one Canadian research chair in global control of HPV related diseases and prevention and professor at the University of British Columbia in the School of Population and Public Health. Gina is also a senior public health scientist at the BC Centre for Disease Control and a senior research advisor at the BC Women's Hospital and Health Centre. She has provided advice and consultation to national and global institutions, including the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, Public Health Agency of Canada, the World Health Organization and Ministry of Health globally on STI, HIV and HPV vaccine policy and programming. Welcome, Gina. Also with us today, we have Dr. Manish Sadarangani, who is the director of the Vaccine Evaluation Center at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute and an associate professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases, UBC Department of Pediatrics. He has worked in pediatrics throughout the world, including in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Australia, North America, and Europe. His research links clinical trials with basic microbiology, immunology, and epidemiology to address clinically relevant problems related to immunization and vaccine preventable diseases. This is a, a, a fantastic uh, uh, lineup, and I am really pleased to introduce both of you. Um, we are uh, we, a lot has been said already today about vaccine. We've heard uh, the day opening with Dr. Fauci, who's told us that the vaccine are safe and we take vaccine safety very, very seriously. So let's dive in a little bit more and understand a little bit more about the process of vaccinology and the immunology behind it. And to this, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Manish uh, Sadarangani to give us a, a brief presentation of his perspective. Thank you, Federica, for the invitation to speak with you today. And I'll just hopefully confirm that you can see the slides okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you today just briefly about vaccine immunity. There's just a few slides. We really want to get to your, to your questions in the Q&A session. These are my disclosures. So I have um, various sources for contributing to my salary. I've had research and project funding from a number of vaccine manufacturers and all funds have gone to my institute. So this is just a very busy slide and I'll just walk through it, but essentially these are all of the COVID-19 vaccines where efficacy has been reported either in peer reviewed public um, literature or in through media reports or press releases. Um, in the top, these top three in blue are the three vaccines that currently have been used across Canada in various immunization programs. The vaccine in, in red here from Janssen is Health Canada approved and we're hoping that will be available soon. Um, the one in orange from Novavax is also one that um, we're hoping to get in Canada at some point. And, and the others are being used in various different parts of the world. You can see here the different platforms. So. We have most of these vaccines using novel genetic based platforms, so the two mRNA vaccines at the top, and then the next four are all using adenovirus vectors. Um, the Chadox vaccine is a chimpanzee adenovirus and the others are human adenoviruses. The Novavax vaccine is a protein subunit vaccine, and then the four here at the bottom, which have been produced by various companies in India and China, use wholesale inactivated viruses. You can see from the dosing regimes that most of these vaccines are, um, have been trialed and tested in two dose schedules. You can see the intervals used in the clinical trials here. Most of them are around 21 to 28 days. Um, the Janssen vaccine trial was with one dose only and the adenovirus 5 um, vaccine produced by CanSino is also one, one dose only. And you can see here the reported efficacy against any symptomatic disease from these vaccines. So the two mRNA vaccines, over 90% are with one dose in the clinical trials and a bit more, so 95% in two doses. Um, Pfizer have recently released data suggesting that this high efficacy is maintained to at least six months after vaccination. 
The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and the Janssen vaccine have around 70% efficacy after one dose or two doses. And the Novavax vaccine is 90% after two doses based on their press release. And you can see these other vaccines um, that we're not going to have available to us in Canada for now have varying efficacies reported from 50% up to 90%. Um, the question is though, what is protecting us after vaccination? And just thinking a little bit at a very sort of basic level about protection against viruses, we have B cells um, that can um, differentiate into plasma cells and produce antibody. Um, and this is clearly the easiest part of the immune system to measure after vaccination. But we also need our CD4 T cells, um, which support antibody production, but also have a number of effective functions of their own. And CD8 T cells that are responsible for direct killing of virally infected cells. Again, a lot has been talked about neutralizing antibody and the, the this function that antibodies have to neutralize um, viruses. Um, but there's a lot of other things that antibody does, and it's important to remember that. So they can opsonize um, different, different microbes, so essentially decorating the surface of the microbes to be taken up by phagocytes. They can activate downstream pathways that result in killing of virally infected cells, such as antibody-dependent cellular site toxicity. And through complement, they can also activate um, phagocytosis of the microbes. Uh, complement activation also results in inflammation and lysis. So there's a lot of different um, effective pathways um, that antibody can lead to. And if we think about the existing viral vaccines, most of the established correlates of protection are based on antibodies. So this is the list of all the viral vaccines or many of the viral vaccines, different types. Um, the ones in the top in the dark blue all have an established correlate of protection just based on the amount of antibody. There's a group here in the middle that have an established correlate of protection based on the function of the antibody, most of which is based on neutralization. There's a few here, these four in red, where the correlate of protection hasn't been quantified, but it's thought to be dependent on antibody. And then the zoster vaccines at the bottom here, where it's thought to be based on T cells. So where does COVID fit in amongst all of this? So the answer is right now, we don't know. There's been initial analysis. This is a preprint um, pre that's available and basically correlating neutralizing antibody in this graph on the left here, um, or just total antibody on the graph on the right, on the x-axis with vaccine efficacy. These analyses are not, are not perfect. There's uh, some caveats around them that we don't have time to go into, but essentially, where you look at neutralizing antibody, there's a moderate correlation between the level of antibody and the vaccine efficacy in the different vaccine trials. Um, there's a better correlation between total antibody and efficacy if you, if you look at total antibody. So suggesting that non-neutralizing antibody may also be important. And I think it'll be understanding correlates of protection that will lead to licensure of more vaccines. And we definitely still need more vaccines than the ones we have right now. So we don't have a correlate of protection yet, but we will need them. Um, clearly antibody seems to be important, both neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibody. T cells are undoubtedly also important, just more difficult to measure. Um, the vaccines have been trying to generate CD4 T cell responses with a Th1 bias, particularly to support um, the, uh, or to try and prevent any antibody dependent enhanced disease. And this will be critical for the approval of future vaccines. So just very briefly to touch on some of the research we do at the Vaccine Evaluation Center. So really cover the breadth of vaccinology with a number of investigators from population evaluation, discovery science um, around pathogenesis and preclinical work, clinical trials, um, looking at vaccine immunogenicity, protective immunity, and then implementation mm -hmm. studies. And we've been very busy over the last year or so with, with COVID research. We've done studies to look at disease transmission and pathogenesis within households, um, various clinical trials, and we have more clinical trials coming, understanding the immune responses to infection um, and in the, moving forward through vaccination. There are a number of phase four studies that are ongoing looking at vaccine safety and including special populations such as transplant cancer, immunocompromised pregnancy, and then looking at the epidemiology of COVID-19 across the country um, and focusing on children. So with that, I will, um, that's the end of the slides I have, and I will hand back to Frederica. Thank you. Thank you, Ma thank you, Manish, for your presentation. This was great. Uh, um, and I would like just uh, uh, before we start our conversation, just to give an opportunity to also Gina uh, to give us her perspective uh, on this topic. 
Thank you, Gina. Thank you so much for this invitation as well and uh, just delighted to be here. So I think uh, Manish very nicely laid out sort of that nice circle of vaccine research. And I know lots of talk today around the genomics platform. And I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the phase four implementation work that's really critical to get some of this absolutely fantastic work that's been done in terms of developing these vaccines into the arms of folks and to, to actually monitor them. So thanks again for this in invitation. So in British Columbia, uh, and I'm just gonna use British Columbia, I know this is a national and international audience, but I'm gonna use our home province of British Columbia as an example of, of the kind of thing that we need to continue to do to monitor the impacts of uh, and, and optimize implementation of vaccination. So we started our vaccine rollout in uh, late uh, December, 2020. And Canada, as many of you know, has, has faced sig significant supply constraints and that has to do with uh, some of the issues around domestic production. Uh, and so right now we are fortunate in May to be looking at a uh, huge uh, increase in supply and that's gonna really be a game changer for us. But there's some other things we need to consider as we continue to roll out the vaccine program. And one of the things we want to distinguish today was, was the difference between vaccine efficacy and uh, Manish gave a really nice overview of the efficacy that we found in the clinical trials, which as you know, are much more sort of structured evaluations where one group has received the vaccine and another group hasn't, and we monitor them prospectively going forward. I'm gonna show you a bit of some of our uh, data that we have in British Columbia that's a, uh, not actually vaccine effectiveness yet. There's an actually a way we wanna calculate that, but just to show you some of the impacts of the vaccination so far to date. And in public health, we focus a lot on things such as the coverage. So who is getting the vaccine? We look at cases, but particularly for COVID-19, we're really interested in actually hospitalizations. We're interested in outbreaks. We're interested in deaths because that's what we really have seen is the real burden of, uh, of this uh, infection and this virus. So here's some data from yesterday from the BC Center for Disease Control, where we're looking at a percentage of men and women in BC with one vaccine dose. And you can see here, we're heading up to almost 90% for folks over the age of 80, uh, over 80% for folks uh, over the age of 70. This is really important because this is, we know was the group that we know that we had a vaccine rollout by age. And we also know these were the groups, particularly older folks who had really shouldered the greatest burden of disease. So this coverage is our first foundation to start to see the impact of the vaccines. And we're starting to see a, a climbing in uh, those over 60, uh, heading up to over 50%, and also for those over 50. And just today, our provincial health officer announced an intention to even vaccinate those from uh, down to age 12. So very exciting times. So, so let's go to the next, uh, the next slide where we see uh, the actual impact on uh, outbreaks. And Early on and throughout the pandemic, we've really had very difficult time in long-term care facilities where we've seen outbreaks and we've seen uh, folks who live in long-term care shouldering a huge burden of disease and also uh, experiencing significant deaths. So this has been a really important marker to see what the impact of vaccination has been. And you can see here, if you see, you can see the, we use the epidemiological week. So if you see two, four, six, eight, that's the start of 2021. And you can see late fall and early uh, 2021, uh, late fall 2020 and early 2021, you can still see the number of outbreaks per week. And then as you can see, as the weeks have rolled by post-vaccination, you can see the number of outbreaks has significantly decreased. Here is uh, more granular data looking at actually it, for folks over the age of 70, those who lived in long-term care and those who didn't, and looking at the cases of COVID. And again, you can see with the dark brown, these are folks who would have received the vaccine earlier. And you can see that we now have very, very few uh, deaths uh, from COVID-19 in folks who are living in long-term care. And we're waiting and we look forward and we're starting to see the impact in folks who are over 70 who don't live in long-term care. They were delayed in getting their vaccine. So we're starting to see impacts of the vaccine program in, in real time. But 
one of the things we have to consider when we look at vaccine programs is vaccine hesitancy. And uh, as many of you know, the WHO has named this as one of the key uh, public health issues and public health threats. And vaccine hesitancy by the WHO refers to a delay in acceptance or even an acti active refusal of vaccines despite the availability of vaccine services. It's a complex issue and there's many different contexts and many different nuances across time, place and, and vaccines. And we're seeing this uh, in Canada with COVID-19. And really what we've distilled the factors to be is that of complacency, that of convenience and that of confidence. So I think this is a really nice um, uh, just graphic to keep in mind when we think of vaccine uh, hesitancy. I think the other thing I wanna underscore is that right now we are seeing vaccine scarcity. So, so we're getting full uptake when folks are offered. But as we move forward with more supply, we need to be ready for addressing the issue of vaccine hesitancy. So to address that, um, uh, we created a team and Manish is part of this team to look at the impact of COVID-19. And we're, we were actually looking across the, the impact of the pandemic controls by a sex and gender lens. But one of the things we specifically wanted to look at was actually intention to receive vaccines. So we looked at a participant pool from studies across BC Women's and BC Children's Hospital, and we recruited them to uh, via our research platforms. And it was a large study to look at demographics, but also intention to receive the vaccine, and also the impact of the pandemic controls on mental health, economics, and reproductive health. So I'm just gonna give you a glimpse on what we found about vaccine intentions. So we use this question, if a COVID-19 vaccine were to become available to the public and recommended for you, how likely are you to receive it? So we did this survey, this was uh, between sort of August and November of last year of 2020. And what we found was that almost 80% stated that they were somewhat or very likely to receive a COVID-19 vaccine when it was available. However, when we drill down to better understand what were some of the predictors? Here's some, some findings from our logistic regression modeling. And you can see that age was a predictor where those who were oldest were most likely to say they plan to get vaccinated. Gender was a, or sorry, sex was a predictor with males uh, saying they were more likely to want to get vaccinated. Uh, education was a predictor, higher education. Uh, folks who uh, identified as non-Indigenous were more likely to plan to get the vaccine. And we saw virtually across the looking at ethnicity, folks who uh, identified as, as any visible minority, South Asian, Black, uh, Southeast Asian, were less likely to intend to get the vaccine. We also saw health workers had slightly difference or essential workers with those who identified as an essential worker who wasn't a health worker, less likely to get vaccinated. Why is this data important? And very important as we think about the rollout and planning for programming. We also looked a little bit more at some of the psychological predictors and what we found was folks who had overall positive act attitudes to vaccine who felt they could get the vaccine when they wanted it and who valued the opinions of folks like Dr. Henry, their family physician and family members, those were all very influential in their decision to take a vaccine. I wanted to just end with this really important conversation about uh, looking at different cultural groups and different communities of color. Because as I said, in all our modeling, we saw that folks who identified as non-white and folks, and specifically folks who identified from South Asian, Southeast Asian and black communities were significantly less likely to plan to receive the vaccine. This is of importance because a lot of those folks are essential front facing workers. And so we need to support those communities to help address some of those issues around vaccine hesitancy that, that can help move them to the place where they feel comfortable receiving a vaccine. So what's the takeaways from this is that we are already in British Columbia showing real benefits to the vaccine program, but we need to have continued support of this rollout. Uh, we can anticipate as uh, scarcity becomes less of an issue that there will be communities where there's higher rates of vaccine hesitancy. We need to think creatively about programming to, uh, that will actually respond to their needs and priorities to ensure that they benefit from COVID-19 vaccine programs. So thank you very much. Okay, can everyone hear me? 
excellent. <laughs> Never sure who's unmuting me, so I bet I check. Thank you very much both. I think this was a great introduction and actually it illustrated perfectly what I wanted to start a conversation with for uh, the, you know, the audience as well. And that is the difference between vaccine efficacy and vaccine effectiveness, which are two words that sometimes I hear interchangeably used, but they're actually not. And you have illustrated this in your presentation rather well. So we have this initial momentum where in trials the vaccine efficacy efficacy is established and, and the vaccine effectiveness is really is, is, and correct me, when we take it out into a real po populations and, and then as Gina has showed us, we really need to monitor this effect in, effectiveness as we move forward. And we've seen what that means for BC right now. So this was really a great introduction. And I, we, as you know, and I want to encourage our audience to continue to um, ask us questions in our conversation I will um, embed the audience questions. And there are already some on this point that I would like to, uh, to pose to you. In particular, um, I think there's, a, um, there's already questions, uh, for example, that are very specific, uh, Manish, and I thought perhaps you could address. And that is, so do we see a difference in immune responses? You talked about antibody responses and you've talked about T cell responses for a different vaccines. Do you see a difference between the AstraZeneca and the other vaccines? vaccine? Is there more of a T-cell versus antibody? And, and if so, could you tell us what that means? So I, I don't know if I can tell you what it means. I can, <laughs> I can try and summarize as best as I can um, some, of the, some of the data. So I think let's talk about the antibody responses first. So we see with the mRNA vaccine, so rather than, I think it's better to think about them as in their groups rather than as individual products. So let's talk about the mRNA vaccines and then the viral vector vaccine separately. Um, so we see with the mRNA vaccines that you get a pretty good antibody response after one dose that is equivalent or maybe even a little bit better than on average people with natural infection. So acknowledging there's a spectrum and even after natural infection, some people have a good antibody response, some people not so much. Um, but so well, as a ballpark, that's there. You get an incredible, of oh, oh, total antibody. You get a huge boost after the second dose. So for the mRNA vaccines, after two doses, you're up at way higher, higher levels than we see from natural infection. For neutralizing antibody, it's very different. And this is why I find really interesting is that after one dose of the mRNA vaccines, there's very little neutralizing antibody actually. Way, you know, maybe 5% or so what you see after natural infection. Yet we see for efficacy, there's this very high efficacy. So I think to me that already starts to give us an indication that there's something else going on in protection, whether that's non-neutralizing antibody or T cells. Again, the neutralizing antibodies are boosted after the second dose and you're getting levels of equivalent or more than natural infection. With the T cell responses, there's not as much data out there on the T cell responses with the mRNA vaccines, but certainly, uh, and the problem with those is it's very hard to compare between studies. They have very different controls and they're all using different assays, but you certainly do seem to get some good TH1 responses, at least after, after two doses of the mRNA vaccines. And for the Moderna vaccine, they also showed after, after one dose, you get that. Um, and no reason to think it will be any different for Pfizer. With the viral vector vaccines, what's interesting is the antibody response is not quite as robust. So after one dose, there's a, there's a good antibody response. Um, there is, interestingly, a, new, a good neutralizing antibody response after one dose of the viral vector vaccines, um, better than we see from the mRNA vaccines. That's, again, boosted with that second dose. Um, but in general, the antibody levels are lower. The T cell responses are really excellent from the viral vector vaccines after, after one dose and don't seem to get boosted with the second dose particularly. Um, there was some suggestion with the, the vaccine in Russia, the Gamalea vaccine, that there is a boosting of T cell responses. And it, that's, very, that's a very interesting vaccine because they use different adenoviruses for their first dose and second dose. So they may be trying to circumvent the anti-vector anti immunity that may be there. Um, so I think in summary, the viral vector vaccines probably give you better T cell responses initially after one dose um, and after two doses it's very hard to, to know if you're getting some equalization. I think what's important because I think to bear in mind is that it's very hard to do head-to-head -head comparisons of all of these data. We know that for efficacy it was a little bit higher for the RNA vaccines than the viral vector vaccines against any um, COVID disease but when it comes to severe disease 
then there's much less of a gap. And we've seen in the effectiveness studies that all of these vaccines are highly effective at preventing the severe disease complications that we're trying to prevent. Thank you, uh, Manish. This is a, a, it was a really important, uh, uh, I think, a point to, to, to clarify. And to this, uh, I think I wonder if we could go a little bit more in detail so, to what you said. You started to talk about immune responses to the first dose and immune responses to the second dose. And so I'd like you to clarify. I'm going to ask a question and I'd like you to clarify first. And then I'd like to move to also Gina and hear from her because this to me goes hand in hand with, with a little Little bit of that hesitancy that we've been talking about. So we know that in BC, and this is a question directly from the audience, we know that in BC there's been a decision to have 120 days separation between the two doses. So um, what does this mean? And I thought that perhaps we could answer in two ways. We could answer from both of your perspective, which I think it will be great. Thank you. Sure. So I can go first. So, um, so I mean, the clinical trials, I think I saw in my, in my, you saw my slides, and I think someone pointed out in the Q&A that for the RNA vaccines, the interval was 21, 28 days. And for the um, AstraZeneca, it was between four weeks and 12 weeks, essentially. Um, and we have really good immune responses, I think, the, and, and very, very high efficacy. I think when it comes to the interval in real life, so by the time decisions were made for policy in Canada, so one, we saw the efficacy in the trials out to two, three months. So that, and that was say, sustained. There was no evidence in the two, three months that there was any, any waning at all. Um, so that by the time we were making those decisions here, we had that data. And then I think the other piece of this that was important, and there has been, this has been published as well, um, that the modeling data suggesting that with the one dose efficacy also being high, um, that essentially we're all trying to, we're trying to get to the same place, right? So we're trying to um, eventually, whatever you do with the dosing interval, you will get to the same end goal of um, controlling the pandemic. The question is how much death and severe disease there is on the way. And the modeling very, very strongly suggested by increasing the interval between doses and getting one dose into as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, you will ultimately prevent more um, severe cases and more death than sticking to the schedule that was used in the clinical trials. Um, and I think we've seen some of the one dose data from the UK, particularly where they've used a 12 week interval, suggesting that, you know, that has been a, a good strategy. Um, but I don't know, Gina G can comment more. Sorry, yeah, Federica. No, you, you go Gina, please. Thank yeah, you. no, I, thanks. And I'll just build, I think, I think also, and I think to, to link it to confidence is really important. I think perhaps what was perhaps missed a bit in the messaging uh, when this came out was that this is actually something we do and have done for years in vaccine programs. So, you know, we, we focus more on minimal intervals than maximal intervals. And if someone misses a dose of a vaccine, we don't often restart, we, we, we continue on. So I think there was also a lot of uh, building on sort of lots of experience um, with public health vaccine programs that, uh, and if you just think about those of us who have gotten vaccines or those of us who have children who we get, you know, we are supposed to come in at two weeks, but we maybe come in at three weeks or we come in, we're supposed to come in at two months and we come in at three months. So we often have greater intervals between what we don't as clinicians really recommend and we often won't vaccinate is lesser inter intervals. So for, for folks, for instance, if the MMR is due on, you know, at, at 12 months, if folks come in at 11 and a half months, we don't give it to them because we want to make sure there's enough time. So I also think that we, we want to underscore that this is not something unusual in the world of public health vaccine uh, program. And I think that uh, it, it was complicated to explain, I would say, because I think folks saw the clinical trials and they said, well, that's what the clinical trial said, that's what we should do. But I think what we saw was taking a public health lens. So standing back and saying, what's, as Manish outlined, what's our actual goal? And our actual goal is to control the pandemic, but also actually to minimize death and suffering. And the best way to do that was to actually optimize first dose coverage. So I think, and, and I think what we'll, we are seeing now with some of the data, and I particularly wanted to show that data today from, that's from the BCCDC website, it's available for anyone to look at, is we are seeing 
a reduction. We're still, we, we, we're just starting to do second doses for folks in who were vaccinated in January. So we are seeing the benefit of that one dose strategy. So I think we need to amplify that to, to improve confidence. And I think Frederica, if I may just briefly, because I think yes, I didn't please. really address the, your question about the immunology of this, is that, you know, if, you know, you see a, a good maintenance of antibodies, say over two months, three months, we now have some data from some of the vaccines that that's six months, you, you know, even not knowing that it's, it's maintained up to six months, you're not even, and even if it wanes a little bit, you're not expecting it to fall off a cliff. Suddenly at three months, it's not like you're going to go from having, you know, 80% of your maximum to, to zero, right? So I think there's going to be a, a little, there'll be a little bit of waning. And I think going back to Gina's point about what we normally do for, we have data from lots of other vaccines that actually by increasing the interval between vaccines in general, after your second dose or booster dose, whatever it is, you will have at least a good immune response, if not better, by having an, an increased interval. And the question then is clearly if you don't fall into a susceptible zone in, in between by increasing it too much. So I think that four months was trying to get that balance. Thank you very much. I think this is actually really, really useful. I do want to be a bit cheeky, Manish, and throw you a question from a fellow colleague who is very knowledgeable about vaccines, uh, from Peggy, which I, I believe is our Peggy Johnston from uh, this morning moderating the, the Fauci section. And her question is really interesting to me. Based on our data regarding the level of antibodies versus efficacy and the half-life of antibodies, how long one can wait between those one and those two to ensure a high level of effectiveness, let's say above 60%. I mean, can we actually answer these questions? Well, so, so that's, a, that's a really interesting question. And I think there's two different ways you can approach that. So you can think about the half-life of a single antibody molecule, right? Which we, you know, is 21, 28 days. But that's not really, it's the half-life of the antibody population, and that depends on the plasma cells, and we have these short-lived plasma cells and long-lived plasma cells constantly churning out antibodies. And actually, there's some studies, I think, going back 10, 15, 20 years ago, looking at the sort of population-level half-life of antibodies against a number of different pathogens. And for some of these things, the sort of half-life, like something like varicella, is decades. So, you know, after vaccination, you can still measure antibody in people decades later that is circulating and that is still there from either from infection or from vaccination. Um, so I think, for, but it does vary. So I think for, for COVID-19, we don't know is, the, you know, is the honest answer how long that is, but I think you would not expect it to be in the range of weeks. You know, you're expecting it. And I think as I said, the Moderna, Moderna recently showed that while at six months, there is some waning of that antibody, it's still higher than natural infection, even six months down the line. Um, so I think most people, if you had to push, were expecting that to be somewhere in the region of one to two years, but, but we don't know. And I think it'll really be long-term follow-up from people who have been infected and people who have been vaccinated to see what the dynamics of that actually looks like. Immunization yes. data are very important. Yes, And Regina. I want to just underscore what Manish said about the trajectory or the decay curves, right? We don't traditionally have decay curves that sort of trundle along and then fall off they, you know, we see a gradual diminution. And so again, all of this, this sort of experience was put together to make these decisions, uh, you know, and it was building on sort of a foundation of, of many sort of intersections of knowledge, I would say. Um, yes, um, just, uh, sorry, I paid a very attention. I'm checking also the, the questions coming in, so keep, keep this alive. But yeah, absolutely, the trajectory doesn't just fall off. I think this is a, a, a very important. So then on this topic, which is a hot topic, um, can I then add another question from the audience? And that is, can we start putting the dreaded variants of concerns into the picture? Um, what, what is the, um, the well, well, again, I, I love to have you both on this panel. You're so complimentary. That is fantastic. Every time somebody answers a question, you, they really are going to get the full answer. So I, I'm guessing, I guess, what, first of all, Manish, what is the immune response in terms of what happens from where, to the different variants? And then how do we deal with this, Gina? <laughs> So, so, so I guess there's two things, you know, one is the immune response and then one is the, how does that translate into clinical efficacy? And then exactly. Gina can tell us how we'll do it. So, I mean, I think 
for those of you who listened this morning, so Dr. Fauci briefly touched on this this morning, and this came up in that conversation as well. That you know, it's not it's not all not all variants are created the same, um, and so as as I think he said. You know, these variants have multiple different mutations that have different impacts, um, and we're seeing that. We're seeing the, the virus constantly mutate, and the variants of concern are those that have been deemed to be physiologically important based on increased transmission or increased disease. So the main variants of concern that, you know, so there's the first one that was identified in the UK, which is the B117, and I think in general that was circulating from very early on, and there's maybe a little bit of a reduction in the neutralization of vaccine um, serum, but the effectiveness data, and even the efficacy data actually, because even in the, some of the trials were done while this variant was circulating show that um, the vaccines are, are very effective against that particular variant. So that's that one's, I think, a relatively straightforward one. The one that was has been a little bit more concerning is the 1351 variant that was originated in South Africa. And there we see a little bit of differences so depending on the different vaccines so some of the vaccines um so for example the, the rna vaccines have shown that about a you know eight fold or so reduction in neutralization ability against those variants in vitro assays um, a huge reduction in neutralization after immunization with the astrazeneca vaccine how that relates to efficacy, though, is interesting because it's been very different. And I think you have to bear in mind it's hard to do head-to-head -head comparisons between the different trials. But if you look at the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine trial that was going on in South Africa at the time this variant started to become predominant, there wasn't a huge difference in efficacy against severe disease um, with the sort of the um, wild-type variant, if you like, and the, the variant, the B1351 variant. If you look at the AstraZeneca vaccine, looking at all disease, there did seem to be a significant reduction in efficacy. And essentially the, the vaccine wasn't efficacious against the variant for, for all disease. But that was based on, you know, if you look at the numbers, it's based on a really small number of people. Um, so I think the effectiveness data that come will, will still be important. And then with the Novavax vaccine in South Africa, there was a little bit of a reduction, but it was down from like 90% down to about 50%. So a little bit of a reduction, but not a huge, huge amount. Um, there's not huge amounts of data right now for the P1 variant, which we've seen, which started in Brazil. And there's also not a huge amount of reliable data for the variant that we've seen um, circulating in, in India. So I think that's where we're at. So, but I think this is really, and I just want to re reinforce really the message from Dr. Fauci from this morning that it's really hard to, under, to, to over, overestimate how important high quality viral genome surveillance is going to be in this sort of as we go into the post-vaccination world. Yeah, and thanks, Manish. I mean, that's a great summary. And I think, you know, we'll also say one of the things we want to do is continue to look at the impact of our, our sort of, you know, things like masking and social distancing. And, and because we haven't, we haven't found any of them that don't respond to that still. So those, those are still tools that we can use. Um, and I, I want to underscore what, Manish said about what Dr. Fauci said, which is this is the critical time for data. And this is the critical time why we, and I'm so proud of our home here in BC, that we have very centralized data sets that we can actively and continually monitor. And, you know, not every variant is a variant of concern, right? So we, we, sometimes our headlines get a little ahead of us and we hear there's a new variant and, and we have to keep in mind that, that not every, you know, mu mutate, and I know it's not a word we like to use because it sounds really scary, but that's what viruses do. Like that, 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 that's, that's literally what they do. So we also want to keep in mind that not every variant is a variant of concern and our data systems are there. And that's why we're monitoring regularly in the detail to see if there's a change in the effectiveness. Um, there's also other tools, and, and Manish alluded to them, lab studies looking at neutralization so we can get some hints, but we really need that spectrum of information to help us, to help inform us. But the good thing so far is that we still have lots of tools against these, these variants. Thank you. And can we clarify for the lay audience, uh, what actually, um, when, when does a variant of concern becomes a variant of interest? There seems to be also some questions about this, please, Gina. Yeah, so it, it has to do with the impact of them. So as I said, viruses, this is what they do. So 
they become a variant of interest when we see a change, we start to see them start to sort of increase in prevalence. And then they become a variant of concern when we start to see, as Manish says, a physiologic change where we start to see, oh, they're slightly more transmissible. One of the things we keep monitoring for is, do any of them have higher morbidity associated with them? So do people get sicker? Do they tend to have a slightly different clinical profile today? So, uh, so it is a judgment call that we make around the sort of experience of that, that variant and whether it's had both a, a clinical or a change in sort of the way it, it behaves. Thank you, uh, Gina, for that clarification. And just going back to BC, and, and where are we? I mean, do we have a good understanding? Because it seems that the two major variants are the B117 and the P1. Is that correct? And if that is the case, are we monitoring immunization? Well, I guess as, as best as we can, given that we are ramping up immunizations right now, but what that means against these two types of variants. So could, could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think Dr. Henry's been very clear about the fact that we're doing routine surveillance and routine monitoring to, uh, uh, to sort of see what's going on. So it's, it's that sort of what we call prevalence monitoring, where you do random samples around the province and see what's happening. So we are, we're definitely doing that. And yes, absolutely. We're also monitoring for uh, vaccine effectiveness and seeing if, uh, you know, what, and, Kelly Grant in the Globe and Mail reported some numbers around what we call, we're, we, I call sort of COVID cases in vaccinated individuals, because we know that folks who are vaccinated will get COVID, that we saw that in clinical trials. It's about how sick do they get. So we've, we also monitor, is there any difference in those COVID cases in, in by variant? So we're absolutely monitoring all of that and seeing if there's any, any issues of concern. And right now, we're really pleased to see, and if you follow sort of some of the, the big journals, you'll see that, that the vaccines continue to be very effective against you know, the majority of variants. And, and Frederica, just to, just to add, because Gina probably went, so, so I think just to, you know, just to re reinforce some of the points around the quality of the data that we have access to here in BC, you know, we have, an immunization registry so we know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't. We have a centralized database where we know who's been tested and who what the result of those tests are. Um, and that can be linked to the to the viral genome data that are also being generated. And, and I think it's only going to be through really carefully designed analyses of looking at these issues to find out if there's truly an enrichment of a specific variant in vaccinated people, and if there's true vaccine escape, rather than that just being a reflection of what's circulating anyway. And, and I guess just to add uh, that it would be, uh, uh, Manish, quite important at this point with regard to the variant uh, to also have this uh, monitoring between the, the vaccination in, with one dose versus the vaccination. I mean, because would you expect a different, obviously there could be a better immune response upon the second dose against these variants? Um, Absolutely. So I think, you know, you, it may be that you know, there could be some variants where the one and two doses make does make a significant difference. You know, we, it may not be the case for all the variants. I think, as I said, for the 117 variant, that seems relatively immunologically susceptible, if, if you like, for one of a better term. So it may be more, more important for other variants. So yeah, absolutely, we have access to all of that data, or there are people who have access to all of that data, and we can look at those questions. So one of the things that is coming up over and over, uh, I hear uh, in the media, and I think the people have asked even in our in, in the, for this panel as well, but it's something we are all thinking, and that is, can we mix vaccines? Can we? <laughs> I mean, where are have you have, as as have you both from a very sort of practic, practical clinical point of view uh, to a public health point of view given any thought today? thought to this? I'll let Manish uh, <laughs> so, that. So yeah, lots of thought has, got, has gone into this. <laughs> I am sure. Um, so I think, you know, so where we are is that, you know, we, we need to answer this question. This is a clearly a really, really important question. We're in the pandemic. We have potential vaccine shortages. We, we, don't, we don't know. So none of the, and, and I think the other piece is that none of the companies are going to do that study, right? So it's really on the academic community to take that question on. 
Um, and so there is an ongoing study in the UK where they're, um, they're mixing the vaccines that are available in their schedule. So they've started off with the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines, and they're looking at different combinations of giving one on then the other and the uh, both ways around and compare with the same vaccine first and second. Um, they're also looking at the issue of timing and we're waiting for data. So, the, so they started that study in February. And so the data will come in the next month or two, I guess, at the, at the earliest. We are hoping to, we're planning and we're hoping to do a similar study in Canada using the vaccines that are available to us in Canada. Um, and again, you know, thinking about all of, all of the possible combinations of the vaccines that are available and putting them together. So I think that over the coming months, we'll get a lot of data on what, that, what the mixing of those vaccines looks like and what the results are, both in terms of the immune response, but all, and then you know, what that may mean for, for protection and looking at variants and, and all of that, I think, is part of the planning. Yes, and I think, I think just to loop it again back to the sort of hesitancy and confidence, I think sometimes the, it gets portrayed as sort of a bit of hocus pocus and we're grabbing one vaccine and another vaccine and let's see. Again, I want to really underscore, this has been part of vaccine programming for years. And we often know that heterologous um, vaccinations actually result in a really nice boosting because you're sort of, Manish explained that, you know, depending on whether you're viral vector or mRNA, different elements of that complicated immune system get charged and engaged slightly differently. So the idea is that by potentially having different you know, vaccines, you're actually going to create a more robust, um, a robust response. So I, I really think it's really important when we talk about this, that it's not sort of a cavalier kind of, oh, this is all we've got in the pantry. So we'll just kind of throw them together and see. This has actually been, again, used for years. And, and just like with the extended interval, you know, there might actually be an, some optimization and some benefit. It's not just as good, but some benefit. We might find the same thing with the sort of the mixed um, mixed types. So I'm actually really excited. I'm really hopeful that we get something going in Canada because I think it's going to be a really important question and uh, will help to guide. It's, it's going to very much guide public health practice going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are almost to an end, but we're not done. There's a couple of things here that to explore just a little bit more. And that, and that is, a, there is a really nice question. It was one of the first questions asked, and I waited until now because I wanted to get to the right moment. I wanted to get to the consideration about, you know, uh, taking into consideration what you have done. Uh, not always a, a vaccine need to be at the highest of effectiveness to be useful. Uh, obviously, we have these examples from the influenza vaccines. I wanted you to comment a little bit about this because it's very relevant with what we've been saying. And also, perhaps also going into uh, touch a little bit about herd immunity. What does it mean when we will reach it? So maybe I'll jump in first. And I think, I think all, of the, my, all of us in public health were delighted, <laughs> thrilled when we saw the mRNA results, because I think you have to remember that this is, we, you know, this was a disease that was really coming hard at older folks. And often we see very more muted um, and reduced responses in older folks. And the fact that we had this robust immune response and robust efficacy, I think we were all really thrilled. And we got a little spoiled because like you said, we, we've, we, you know, the, the flu vaccine, we're often at 60, 70%, not even there. And, and it offers, a, it's an important tool in control for influenza. So, you know, I think that, that the fact, we're all thrilled to see this level of protection. We're thrilled to see, there was some data that came out today about the effectiveness of the vaccine in, um, in Israel that showed it was, it's been tremendously both not only efficacious, but effective. So, so I think that we are, have all been sort of pleasantly and delighted and surprised and absolutely delighted at the sort of high efficacy that we're seeing with many of these products. I'll hand it to you, Manish, if you have anything to add. Yeah, so, so I, I think I, I just wanted to come back to the herd immunity question. And I think it's, you know, clearly there's a need to try and keep the messages simple, um, but I think it's, it's, it's not simple. I think this is, you know, so maybe this, you know, given you've asked it, it gives us a chance to think about this a little bit in that, you know, herd immunity essentially means that you can protect 
everyone by vaccinating enough of enough of the population. And but what's really important is vaccinating enough of the people who are transmitting the infection. And so let me, if I can give you an example, so for pneumococcal disease, so bacterial infection causes devastating, you know, pneumonia, meningitis, septicemia, et cetera. Most of the transmission of that bacteria is from children under five. And so we saw when vaccines were developed for that age group. So we've had vaccines for the older people for a long time. They're, you know, polysaccharide vaccines. They're not that great at mucosal immunity. And so you don't get much of a herd immunity effect because the herd immunity relies on the vaccines, not only preventing disease, but preventing transmission. So you need to have some sort of mucosal level immunity. When we started getting the conjugate vaccines into young children and started vaccinating, once you know, a high number of those kids were vaccinated, we started seeing reduced disease in the elderly people who were not being vaccinated and just by vaccinating the toddlers and the young kids. So because they were the ones transmitting the disease. We see that for meningococcal disease, the adolescents in that for that particular disease are the ones who transmit the, the bacteria. And by getting high coverage in adolescents, you can protect the entire population. So it's really about, to me, about getting high coverage in those people who are doing most of the transmission. Because, and again, you know, we're now starting to see really nice data for the mRNA vaccines and the viral vector vaccines that they do reduce transmission. There's a really nice household study that was as it published as a preprint last week from the UK showing both of the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccines significantly reduce transmission within households by about 40 to 50% after even one dose. Um, so we don't have a, it's, it's really been difficult to figure out what, who is transmitting this disease. I think it is very context specific, but as long as we can get enough people vaccinated in the, amongst those people who are transmitting, then I think that we, you know, I'm optimistic that we may get to somewhere that something that looks like herd immunity and, you know, essentially be able to break transmission enough to protect um, everyone. Yeah, and I want to really underscore what Manish just said at the very end. We're really also we're trying to protect everyone, and we're trying to also focus on reducing deaths, hospitalization, severe illnesses. Right. So that's you know, and we know long COVID is a problem for for a percentage of folks, but we also know there's some very real serious morbidity associated with the infection, particularly as you get older in the older age spectrum, and so. Um, as, as Manish said, the herd, the herd immunity definition is a bit complicated because it's about a number of things, but really what we want to do is actually see that minimizing of the, the burden that we're putting on, on those folks and really minimize hospitalizations, deaths, and, and serious and severe illness. Thank you. This is an important message, particularly because it is complex and, and, and we hear different messaging and also different countries as we heard through the day and yesterday. We've seen how different countries globally as well have taken different approaches. So, uh, uh, you know, um, but thank you for this clarification. I think this is really important. There is a question that I really would like to ask you because I think it's an important one and it's in everyone's mind. Um, People that already have had COVID-19, you know, I've heard you, Manish, saying that the natural immunity, you know, the vaccine's immunity is stronger than the natural immunity. So people that have already had COVID-19, would they benefit to be vaccinated? If so, should they have to wait a period of time from the recovery? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. So, so I think that, you know, and some of the data coming sort of shows, and, and I guess when you think about it biologically, it makes sense that if you've had COVID-19 and you have antibodies and then you get your first dose of vaccine, then it basically looks like a booster response. You, you know, so you already have something and you're getting a booster. So for everyone else who's not been had COVID-19 before, it's like getting their second dose already. Um, and so there's clearly, you know, that advantage. And so there's been some, some discussion um, that maybe if you've had COVID-19, you only need one dose and you shouldn't get two doses. I think the difficulty comes with then trying to translate that into a public health program. And it's fine in the case of a study, you can measure someone's immune response before vaccinating them, all these sorts of things. We don't really have the infrastructure to do that on a mass scale, right? To see, oh, you've already had it, let's check. Because not everyone, as said earlier, not everyone has the same response to an infection. So yeah, there'll still be some people who've had a mild infection perhaps 
or and who don't have antibodies and who may still need the benefit of both the doses to get up to that level. So I think at a public health programmatic level, it's a different it's a different question as to what, you know how to how to address that. And you know, let me give you the example of measles vaccine. 90% of people will have perfectly adequate immune response to one dose of measles vaccine, and we still give everyone two doses because we want to try and catch all of those people that didn't make a response. So I think it's it's really about having something that it can be operationalized. I think there's clearly some, you know, there's clearly a lot of protection from having infection, but uh, at a public health level, I think you need to just have a program where you say, look, we can't be guaranteed. You can't be guaranteed to have protection. We don't know how long that lasts after natural infection. So your safest way to have long-term enduring protection is to get two doses. Yeah. And, and the way I think that, I think there's a couple of things too, you know, we're in a global pandemic and, and if, if we recall in sort of March, April, May last year, we were asking folks not to get tested if they had. So there are some folks who actually aren't certain. And so as Manish said, we're not, in, in our public health programming, testing everyone before they come in. The, the other flip of it is, you know, we wanna make sure it's safe. That's the other thing is that if people had, had COVID and then get two doses, is that safe? And we know that's safe. So I think that's the other important message. So we have to think about it, you know, and this is the challenge, we're in a dynamic situation, but for now, when we prioritize where our efforts go for right now, I think folks who have, think they've had or know they had COVID, just going forward, there's a benefit for them to be vaccinated. This is uh, great. Thank you very much. That's an, an important question. And then going back, um, Gina, the, the, you know, we, we almost uh, at the end of our panel, but there is an important consideration to make and discuss with you. And that is, you know, the communications to the public. Um, I have a, a lovely question, and if I can read it to you, who says, from my experience listening to many people who are hesitant about the vaccines, it is more so a result from unclear communications. What are your thoughts on this? And certainly, you know, I see both sides of the coin. This is, uh, there are some very complex uh, you know, realities at play here, and we've sort of gone through some of them in this panel's discussions, but what are your thoughts? Can we be clear? Can we be better at communicating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is a really important reflection. Uh, both Manish and I have been, you know, working in this, the field of vaccine confidence, vaccine hesitancy for, you know, quite some time. I'm not sure I would distill it only to that. I think the communications are enormously helpful and important. And I spend a lot of my time and have for the past, you know, almost two decades working one-to-one -one with people doing presentations like this and really trying to distill to clear messages. I do think that there are ways, uh, and you know, we have folks like Tim Caulfield who've shown us that by using kind of appropriate narratives wrapped in appropriate numbers so people can understand it and translating it to people's experience, that that can be enormously helpful. However, I don't also want to forget that there are some other things. Complacency, you know, I think uh, for, for folks like me and Manish who've worked globally, I think we're both shocked when we come back to Canada and people are maybe a little cavalier about things like polio vaccines or a little cavalier about things like tetanus vaccines because we've seen what happens when you don't have those. So complacency is also about experiencing that disease. And I think part of why you see an 80, 85% interest in COVID vaccinations is it's kind of touched everyone. I also think that convenience and we use convenience, you know, the WHO uses convenience and there's sort of a drive through mentality. And I, that's not what that's about. That is about the very real fact that for many folks to get vaccinated, they, if, for instance, if you think of trying to take a kid to get vaccinated, you are taking time off work, you're then taking your bus to get to your kid, you're then taking that kid to whatever office it is, then you're bringing that kid, oh, the kid wasn't feeling well, or there was a two hour delay at the doctor's office, so now you're taking the kid back, then you're dropping them, you're, and, and that's a day's work. And so I also think we have to think about how, for instance, we're using mass vaccine clinics right now. I think that's a great idea that's not going to work for everyone. And so we, we sort of think about convenience as driving through McDonald's, it's not about that. So yes to communication, 
and it can be better and it can be done from the right communities. And this weekend I'm working with the black community to do a presentation and they want to hear from black physicians. Delighted to do that. But I think, we, I think it is a little bit bigger than that. And we have to come at it from all angles to really address it. Manish, I don't know if you have any. No, I think, really, I think, I think it was a really nicely worded question, actually. And I thank you, Frederica, for, re, for reading out because it was really talking about improper and unclear communication. I feel sometimes it's turned into, it has to be simple communication. And I think, you know, as we've been discussing for the last hour, some of these issues are not simple. And I think that, I, I think, you know, people, people get that. I, and I think we have to give them the credit of trying to explain things to them as simply as possible and as clearly as possible, but not to oversimplify in this, you know, the media always want their soundbite and you want your, you know, thing you can put on Twitter and all the rest of it. But I think when it comes to these sorts of things, we need to be honest. And I think we need to be transparent. And if there's a complicated message, we need to figure out how to make it understandable but not at the expense of oversimplifying it, because then I think that's where the communication breaks down. I think this is key, what you just said. I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that uh, transparency and honesty is important, and I know it's a really difficult job, and you work relentlessly for this, and so thank you to both, as well as many other but others, um, but we shouldn't shy away for just because it's complicated. The message. I, I, I think people, especially in the with in in this new digital world where informations are given to us all over the places and absorbed for, by us, we people are thirsty to understand, even if uh, you know a, a concept is complex. And I think that we, and I think this really goes because I know because I'm actually even a scientist, although I'm behaving maybe now like a lay pe person in the public, but, but, but even, even when I'm a scientist, I also feel the same way. I feel hesitancy when I don't have the information and the information are not transparent to me. So I think this is across the board, even for people that do not have the, uh, you know, um, uh, perhaps uh, understand because they are closer to, 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 the, to the topic. So I thank you very much for, for that point. And, um, and, and yes, we've come to successfully the end of our panel conversation, which is a real shame because we could, we could have gone much, much longer. I think this is really uh, an important conversation, but thank you very much for your input and contribution. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, absolutely. It's been a pleasure.